Richard Dadd was born on August 1st, 1817 in Chatham, Kent, England. Richard was naturally inclined to drawing and painting as a young boy. He spent hours sketching the people and scenes around him, capturing the essence of everyday life with remarkable skill for such a young lad. But tragedy struck when Richard was just seven years old. His mother passed away, leaving the family grieving. Richard's father, Robert, later remarried, but then a few years later, his second wife died too. Robert was a chemist by trade. He also loved geology and collecting fossils in his free time. By the time Richard graduated from school at the age of 14 in 1831, Robert already established the Chatham and Rochester Philosophical Institute as a small local museum. Sadly though, it wasn't successful and he had to shut it down. So what's next? Robert is at a point in his life where he's twice widowed, and his career dreams have failed, so he decides to move to London to get a fresh start, and so his son can be closer to the action and pursue his artistic talents. This was great because Richard got into the Royal Academy of Arts a few years later in 1837 when he was 20 years old. There he was able to hone his technical skills and develop his unique style. He even joined a group of students who called themselves the Click. They'd challenge each other to paint interpretations from their favorite authors. During this time at the Academy, Richard's talent caught the eye of prominent artists and critics. He received praise for his meticulous attention to detail and ability to capture the beauty of the natural world. Things were looking promising for Richard. Now we reach his fateful journey in July of 1842. Because he had begun to make a name for himself as an artist, Sir Thomas Phillips, a former mayor, handpicked Richard as his trusty draftsman for an epic expedition across Europe to far-off lands like Greece, Turkey, and even the mystical realms of Egypt, which at this time was the beginning of that Victorian era obsession with all things ancient Egypt. So of course, Richard was happy to go. As the months rolled by, they traversed the rugged terrain of southern Syria, battling the elements and braving the unknown. From the ancient streets of Jerusalem to the vast wilderness of Jordan, they pressed onward. This trip was amazing and wildly inspirational for Richard. He kept a close record of his experiences by sketching in a notebook, intending to turn those sketches into detailed paintings after the trip. But it was in the waning days of December as they sailed up the Nile that things got weird. Richard's demeanor shifted, delusions clouded his mind, and he became convinced he was no mere mortal, but a vessel for the ancient Egyptian god Osiris himself. The crew watched as Richard's behavior grew increasingly erratic, his grip on reality slipping. He started to exhibit signs of paranoia and delusion. At first, they attributed his condition to sunstroke, but even out of the sun, it became clear that something far worse was wrong with Richard. He was so consumed with the gods and symbols of ancient Egypt and the Middle East that the Christian iconography disoriented him completely when he returned to Rome for the last leg of the trip. He saw it through a lens of distrust and evil. He felt like he was being watched by the devil. Richard Dad returned home earlier than expected in 1843. He was 26 now. His mind still swirling with the echoes of distant lands and ancient mysteries. Friends and family back home in Kent saw him with concern, noticing something was off about him. They still thought, maybe it's just sunstroke? But they probably knew it was worse than that. Driven by a delusion that twisted his perception of reality, Richard believed himself to be the divine offspring of the Egyptian god Osiris. In his tortured mind, his father became an imposter, a mere mortal standing in the way of his divine destiny. One evening, on a walk through the park with his father, Richard was overcome by a sudden and violent frenzy. Without warning, he lunged at his father, first hitting him in the back of the head, then slicing him with a razor. Then he grabbed a five-inch knife that he must have had stashed somewhere and plunged it deep into his father's chest. Then he dragged his father's body over to a ravine and just left it there, where it was found the next morning. Fleeing the scene of his crime, Richard set off to Dover, where he caught a boat and went to Calais, France. Richard had already applied for a passport shortly before this event, so we know that the murder wasn't entirely a whim out of nowhere. And if murder wasn't enough to prove this man was unwell, well, there's more. On his way to Lyon, riding a coach, he saw signs in the night sky and decided the gods wanted a new sacrifice. He attacked someone on the coach with the same razor he used on his father. So of course, he was captured by French authorities and sent to an asylum, where he had to stay for 11 months before being extradited back to London. His once promising life is now irrevocably stained by murder and madness. 
1844, now back in London, Richard skipped the courtroom drama and landed straight in Bethlehem Hospital, commonly known as Bedlam. He was deemed a criminal lunatic and sentenced to live out his days there. Conditions were rough when he first arrived. After all, institutions were not known to be all too kind or empathetic when it came to actually treating patients for their mental health issues. But there was some hope. After the hospital's first resident physician, Sir William Charles Hood, made some changes to the place. It's in part thanks to Hood that Richard was able to continue painting while in the hospital. While at Bedlam, he created works like the Passion series, which is about an array of emotions and the human condition. Here we have agony, ambition, jealousy, love, pride, recklessness. Here is a sketch for a work he was planning called Crazy Jane. It's based on a poem about a woman losing her mind, which resonated with him. He also painted portraits of those who cared for him, such as his physician, Sir Alexander Morrison. Time in the asylum had the upside of allowing Richard the freedom to paint purely for himself. He didn't have to care about a well-receiving audience to earn a living. He wasn't there to earn a living. He was only there to pass the time. So he painted Contradiction, Oberon and Titania. It is full of fairies and Shakespeare. It depicts the standoff in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Act 2, Scene 1. His love of Shakespeare stuck with him for his whole life. His masterpiece, The Fairy Feller's Master Stroke, is a painting about Queen Mab, the fairy midwife who is a character merely mentioned, but not actively in, Romeo and Juliet. Queen Mab puts dreams into the heads of dreamers. It's a big painting with so much detail that I doubt it can all be taken in one viewing. Sometime in the mid-1860s, Richard was transferred from Bethlehem to the newly built Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum, where he'd stay in until his death on January 7th, 1887, at the age of 68. It's always a shaky thing to diagnose someone from the past, but it seems Richard Dad suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. Richard Dad's art style is often characterized by meticulous attention to an enormous amount of detail, vibrant colors, and fantastical subject matter. Influenced by his time's romantic and Victorian artistic movements, Dad's work often depicts mythical and historical themes, infused with a sense of otherworldly beauty. He possessed a remarkable ability to render complex scenes with precision, whether it be the delicate features of a fairy or the elaborate architecture of a fantastical landscape. Micro, macro, he knew how to obsess in both scopes. His paintings often conveyed a sense of mystery and enchantment, drawing viewers into a world of imagination and wonder, perhaps with a side of eeriness too. And much like his college days, he continued exploring themes of mythology and literature. Despite his struggles with mental illness, or perhaps because of them, Richard Dad's artistic vision remained vibrant and imaginative. He held on to his fascination with the supernatural and the mystical. It's unclear how long he held on to the belief that he was the son of Osiris. But regardless, he has become a symbol of the tortured artist archetype. Thank you so much for watching. Now, go look at some art.